In the last two videos, we examined two major objections to scientific realism, uh, the pessimistic induction and the underdetermination problem. Um, I think that the pessimistic induction is simply a bad argument, uh, as I explained in the video. The underdetermination problem is, in my view, a bit more serious, but you can't help but worry that it's, it's one of those sort of abstract philosophical problems that's kind of divorced from the facts of scientific practice. Um, well, Kyle Stanford has recently suggested a third objection to realism, which is essentially a combination of the pessimistic induction and underdetermination, and he thinks it's more serious than both of those problems, and he calls it the problem of unconceived alternatives. Basically, the challenge is that when we look at, over the history of science, we see that scientists failed to conceive of good alternatives to the theories that they accepted. For instance, the evidence for Newtonian mechanics also serves as evidence for the general relativity theory that would replace it. Of course, uh, during Newton's time and for some time afterwards, general relativity was simply never conceived of. Uh, it, it was never even considered to be a viable challenger because, of course, nobody thought of it. Now, the problem is, uh, obviously, the claim that a theory can, the, the claim that a theory is true, can only be justified if there are no potential challenges that are equally good or better. And the problem of unconceived alternatives is that the history of science suggests that there are good reasons to think that there are indeed challenges to our theories that are equally good or better. There are rivals to our theories that are equally good or better. We just haven't thought of them yet. So over the history of science, in every field of science, at any time, uh, we have been able to conceive of only one or a few theories that were confirmed by the evidence. At later times, radically different theories were conceived that were just as compatible with the evidence. In other words, history shows us that in the past we have always failed to conceive of alternative theories that were just as good as accepted theories. So we can reason by induction uh, that we probably fail to conceive of alternative theories that are just as good as the theories we currently accept. Here's a uh, formalization of the argument. Premise one, the historical record reveals that there were alternatives to the accepted theories uh, of the past um, that, that were equally good as accepted theories but that past scientists failed to conceive of, um, from which we can conclude by induction. There are probably equally good alternatives to current theories that current scientists fail to conceive of. Uh, and the next conclusion is, of course, we should not believe that currently accepted theories are true. Uh, so recall from the last video that the realist, um, one of the responses to the underdetermination argument is to challenge the defender of the underdetermination argument to produce the empirically equivalent rival. If you're claiming that a successful theory has a rival that could do just as good of a job, the onus is on you to tell us what, it, what that rival is. Uh, Stanford uses this historical induction to attempt to avoid that challenge. The history of science tells us that we have good reason to think that there are such theories, even if we can't specify them precisely. Uh, we have good reason to think that contemporary scientists fail to conceive of the viable alternatives. Now, there are a couple of things to notice about Stanford's argument. First of all, it doesn't require total empirical equivalence. We don't need to suppose that the alternative theories make exactly the same claims about the world, as was supposed in the original underdetermination argument. General relativity doesn't make the same claims as Newtonian mechanics. Indeed, that's why Newtonian mechanics was eventually displaced uh, in favour of, of relativity, because the, the relativity theory is more predictively successful. Stanford thinks that the anti-realist uh, simply doesn't need empirical equivalence to make her case. Um, the, the real problem is that rival theories may be compatible with the limited evidence we have available right now. Uh, if, if the theories make different claims that could be decided by future evidence, well, that's no help. And for one thing, because the future evidence might decide in favour of the rival. So there's no need to, to, worry, to, to, to be concerned about showing that theories are empirically equivalent. That's, quite a, that's obviously a very difficult thing to show, and uh, Stanford thinks that the anti-realist doesn't need to meet that kind of standard. Second, notice that this isn't, strictly speaking, an induction over past theories. It's an induction over past theorists, past scientists. I didn't talk about this in the other video, 
But one problem with trying to perform an induction over past theories is that it's very difficult to uh, specify the inductive base, because what counts as a theory? Uh, different scientists will hold different versions of a theory, and theories will change over time. I mean, is, uh, is modern Darwinism the same theory as 19th century Darwinism, but with significant changes? Or are they uh, different theories that include similar core claims? I mean, it's not obvious how to, how to demarcate theories. And obviously, there's no problem uh, at all with, with specifying individual scientists. Um, so, at least in principle, with Stanford's induction, we're able to, um, to determine the exact population on which the induction is being performed. And that arguably puts, him, puts his argument, again, on a slightly more secure footing. Um, so that's the, that's the basic argument that, that Stanford gives. Uh, now, uh, Daryl Rowbottom points out that this argument can be extended in various ways. Stanford frames the argument in terms of unconceived theories, but there are actually many other ways we might run it. So, I mean, we have to ask, you know, why exactly are unconceived theories a problem? Well, it's because that the point is that if we did conceive of them, such theories would lead us to reject, or at least to suspend judgment on, our currently accepted theories. Now, the same is true of many other things. For instance, there may be unconceived predictions. Um, so, you know, a theory might entail certain claims about the world uh, that, that past scientists are missed, and then future scientists realise that actually, you know, you can make this particular prediction with a theory. Uh, there may be unconceived experiments and instruments. Obviously, as technology improves, there are uh, all sorts of very surprising and, you know, uh, from the point of view of the past, there are just unimaginable new ways to test theories. People living in the 1800s would probably never have been able to imagine the sort of modern particle accelerators that we have, for instance. Uh, there are uh, unconceived methods, okay, methods of uh, statistical analysis, um, developments in probability theory, and so on. Uh, again, people in the 1800s just never conceived of this. Assessment of theories depends on the evidence, and the evidence available and the interpretation of the evidence depends on the experiments we perform and the methods of analysis uh, we have to, uh, to, to, to look at that evidence. So when people in the 1800s tried to evaluate their theories, they did so with poorer methods. Later methods, you know, methods of statistical analysis and so on, allowed us to see problems with theories that were once missed. Similarly, uh, scientists at a later time have said they may realise that certain important predictions were missed by scientists at an early time. So we should expect uh, that we are in a similar position. In the future, uh, new predictions may be derived from theories, new methods may be developed, new technologies may allow us to test theories in uh, new and so far unconceived ways. So that is the argument from unconceived alternatives. How might the realist respond? Well, first of all, um, P.D. Magnus notes that Stanford's argument only compels scepticism about those conclusions that have been drawn by eliminative inference. Eliminative inference involves inferring an explanation by eliminating the alternatives. Uh, to use the example I cited in an earlier video, suppose we're investigating the murder of the head of a household. We know that the murder was committed by one of 10 remaining members of the household, but we're not sure who. If we investigate nine of them and rule them out, then we know that the guilty party must be the last remaining member. Um, that's a basic sort of eliminative inference. And the same method is used in science. A body of data may support various theories. We devise experiments to test between the various theories until we whittle them down to just one. But obviously, uh, this only justifies believing the theory if we have good reason to think that our initial pool of the theories was complete. So with the murder case, um, perhaps we should have considered everybody in the village as a viable suspect. In that case, the fact that we've ruled out all but one member of the household wouldn't give us much reason to think that the remaining member of the household is guilty, because our initial pool of possible suspects was, um, it was too small. Uh, so what Stanford tries to show is that we have good reason to think that we... Um, we don't have this, this sort of complete pool of theories on the table because there are good alternatives that we have failed to conceive of, which means we're not justified in believing currently accepted theories. So that's so. So, so the argument uh, 
is a scepticism against conclusions drawn by eliminative inference, which is a, a standard kind of inference in the sciences. But there are two points that we do need to make here. First of all, this, uh, this argument therefore depends on the claim that for each domain, there are a large number of such alternative theories. There are a large number of theories that are plausible, but significantly different. And, you know, is, is that true? Because if the viable alternative, uh, if, the, if the sort of pool of plausible alternatives is actually very small, then that should increase our confidence that current theories are correct. You know, if there are only three or four plausible theories, or if we've examined uh, a, a few plausible theories in the past and rejected them, that would actually suggest that our current theory is likely to be true. So uh, Stanford's argument, again, depends on, on the question of, of just how many alternative theories there are. I, I talked about this point um, in the video on the original pessimistic induction. Uh, more interestingly, M Magnus suggests that many scientific claims simply don't rely on eliminative inference. For instance, the claim of uh, gravitational uh, light bending. Um, so this is the, the claim that the, the gravity of a large mass will bend space and so redirect light from distant stars. Um, arguably, there is no eliminative inference here. We simply observe it, uh, for instance, with, with the sun in, in Eddington's eclipse photos. Of course, if we are to generalise this phenomenon to large masses in general, then we have to assume that other large masses are in relevant respects the same as the sun, you know, they uh, are based on the same laws and so on. Although that's not, I'm not, I'm not sure that's actually an eliminative inference. I think that would be more of a, uh, more of a kind of projective induction. Um, but uh, this is the, the example Magnus cites. I'm not sure this example is really relevant here because uh, pretty plausibly, I think we would argue that light bending is an observable phenomenon. Um, remember, we're interested in the status of unobservables. But I think there are plenty of claims about unobservables that similarly uh, don't involve eliminative inference either. Let's say we examine the E. coli bacterium under a microscope and we describe properties like its structure, its behaviour, the rate at which it reproduces and so on. Well, prima facie, there doesn't seem to be any eliminative inference here. Um, the, the natural way to describe this would be to say that we are uh, we're just looking at the bacteria and we are describing what it's doing. Um, you know, E. coli is an unobservable. You can't. It, it, it requires special instruments to see it. But I mean, it's certainly not obvious that there's an eliminative inference in in describing the structure and behaviour of E. coli. There will be, if you get into more theoretical sides of it, you know, like it's uh, maybe specifying its genome or something like that. But again, if you're just looking at it, describing its behaviour and and how it reproduces, it's not clear to me that 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 involves any eliminative inference. So that might be one way we could start to uh, resist the sceptical consequences of uh, Stanford's argument. A second objection is that, as with the original pessimistic induction, the historical record simply doesn't support Stanford's case. St uh, Stanford does give a number of historical examples of scientists who failed to conceive of alternatives. Um, I, I didn't sort of go into them, go into his cases in detail because his cases come mostly from uh, pre twentieth century. He actually focuses a lot on on biology from before the twentieth century. But as we foc as we saw uh, in the video on the pessimistic induction, uh, this is the infancy of science. Ninety five percent of all scientific work has been done since nineteen fifteen, and during that time, we've actually seen a remarkable amount of stability. If we focus on science since 1915, there's no good reason at all to think that in the future we might come up with alternatives that will displace the currently accepted theories. And furthermore, when we focus on theories in the past, in the, in the distant past from before the 20th century, many of them that have been technically refuted are in fact substantially correct. So the uh, development from Mendelian genetics to molecular genetics. Well, the Mendelian theory I mean, maybe technically false in various respects, but it's still approximately true, and it is indeed still taught to students of biology. Um, you know, the, the existence of unconceived alternatives only matters if those alternatives are radically different to accepted theories. The alternatives have to be such that if they were true, the currently accepted theory would just be false and not even approximately true. 
We also saw that modern methods and technology are superior, and there are far more scientists working on the problems. With respect to methods and technology, note that, uh, as Sherilyn Rouge points out, we now have methods for ruling out entire classes of theories without even conceiving of them, because we can employ uh, statistical analyses, uh, we can take large sets of data, feed the data into computers and so on. That allows us to rule out uh, whole classes of theories and models. Uh, if you're trying to model, say, the evolution of the solar system, um, we don't have to conceive of every theory because we can use computer simulations to rule out the least plausible ones. Uh, Roosh also gives the example of quantum mechanics, um, where uh, we're able to rule out, and I quote, all of the theories that share a few extremely general assumptions, including locality, single-valuedness of reality, fair distribution of microstates, and hidden variables. Any theory with all of these assumptions is shown to be highly unlikely in light of the experimental f falsification of the inequalities that follow from them. Um, and the point, of course, is that we didn't actually have to conceive of those theories in any detail. Uh, we, could, we could just rule them out, um, you know, uh, as, as a whole class without thinking of each particular one. Uh, the number of working scientists is especially pertinent to Stanford's argument because, uh, of course, it, it concerns conceived alternatives. Now, if there are far more working scientists, there are far more opportunities to conceive of alternative theories. There is no need for any particular proponent of a theory to see all of the alternatives. All that matters is that somebody is able to, uh, to conceive of them. Now, in the past, the scientific community was much smaller, which means they were less able to develop alternative theories. And that's one thing that blocks an induction from the failure to consider alternatives in the past uh, to inferring that we're also failing to consider alternatives. There are other features of modern science that uh, arguably make it better place to develop alternatives. First of all, note that scientists of the past tended to come from very similar social backgrounds. Most scientific work was done by uh, white European men from fairly rich families, so it was quite a homogenous community. But that means that there were less, um, you know, arguably less perspectives. You know, there, there was, they were all people sort of from the same cultural background, which meant there were less opportunities for, for kind of radically different ideas. Second, scientists tended to share uh, philosophical assumptions. One element of this was religion. Uh, religion provides a metaphysical framework and most scientists of the past accepted the same kind of framework, um, you know, metaphysical framework based on Christianity um, or, uh, I mean, since the Enlightenment, maybe also some sort of deism or whatever, but it was it was quite limited. Um, most scientists tended to accept Christianity or or some sort of deism there wasn't a wide range of um, philosophical backgrounds like there are now. And I mean, more generally, I think that uh, we're arguably just more, more open to, uh, to weirdness these days. Quantum mechanics was developed in the early 1900s, and one of the striking things about it is that it's just uh, utterly, absolutely bizarre. When you read about some of the results of quantum mechanics, it, it almost seems contradictory. Uh, very difficult to wrap your head around it. The quantum revolution has opened our minds to the weirdness of the universe. We're more prepared to explore uh, radical alternatives. So the challenge then is, well, you know, why uh, exactly have we, have we failed to develop radically different alternatives to, for instance, general relativity? This is despite the fact that we know that general relativity is incomplete, um, we, we know that it, it's not the, the sort of complete theory of the universe. We think it's, most scientists think that it is at least approximately true, but it has limitations. So actually there is quite a powerful incentive for developing alternatives, and yet we haven't. Despite the fact that there are far more scientists working today, despite the fact that we have better methods, um, despite uh, arguably uh, a sort of more open-mindedness in science. Similarly, why have we failed to develop radically different alternatives to the modern evolutionary synthesis? Why have we failed to develop radically different alternatives to the standard model in physics? I mean, perhaps there are radically different alternatives to all these theories, but I would suggest that the history of science doesn't provide any, uh, any basis for thinking, for thinking that this is the case. Um, the history of science suggests that these theories will remain stable. Now, uh, certain ideas uh, that were 
that were quite popular in the philosophy of science may help Stanford uh, sort of respond to this point. Um, so uh, one of the most famous philosophers of science is Thomas Kuhn. Uh, he's had an enormous influence on the subject and his book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, is, is really required reading for anybody interested in philosophy of science. So if you haven't read it, then you should buy it and read it because it's really important. I assume you're interested in philosophy of science if you're this far into the series, so uh, you should you should go and read it. Um, obviously, I'm not going to explain Kuhn's whole philosophy here, but I will outline one important component. Um, Kuhn's book, as the title suggests, is about scientific revolutions. But most scientific activity, what, what Kuhn calls normal science, is not revolutionary. During normal science, all of the scientists of a particular field accept a specific uh, theoretical framework, which Kuhn calls a paradigm. Uh, the paradigm is a shared set of concepts, propositions, methods, values, and so on, that help to structure and direct scientific activity. The paradigm defines what sorts of questions are to be asked. It defines how to answer them. So it, so it tells you what sorts of experiments to do and what kinds of theories would be acceptable uh, answers. It defines how to interpret scientific observations, and so on. Now, the crucial point is that the paradigm itself is a shared assumption. It simply goes unquestioned, at least during normal science. Any scientist who, uh, any scientist who tried to develop a radical, a radically different alternative, would simply not be taken seriously. They would be seen as rejecting the basic facts and methods of the discipline. Now, any paradigm uh, will face some anomalous results, results that are quite difficult to explain in terms of the paradigm. Uh, and of course, in many cases, solutions will be devised. For instance, Newtonian mechanics initially seemed unable to account for the orbit of Uranus. Uranus, uh, it, it may have looked like this falsified the Newtonian paradigm, but it was postulated that perhaps there was another planet so far unobserved whose gravitational influence on Uranus was causing the uh, or, or orbital discrepancies. And this famously is what led to the discovery of Neptune, because there indeed was another planet that was causing the discrepancies in Uranus's orbit. But in a few cases, the anomalies will become intractable. Um, so as with Uranus, it was known that there were discrepancies in the orbit of Mercury. Scientists tried to account for this by postulating another planet even closer to the Sun, which was dubbed Vulcan, but uh, despite the efforts of many great astronomers over many decades, Vulcan was never discovered. Mercury's orbit became an intractable anomaly. And over time, intractable anomalies may build up. Uh, another no anomaly for the accepted theory of the 1800s was the null result in the michelson morley ether experiment. These anomalies precipitate a period of crisis, during which the current paradigm begins to lose support. Now, it's only during such... These, these rare crisis periods that alternatives are seriously explored. Okay, So during normal science, scientists are encouraged to adhere to a particular paradigm. Only in very unusual circumstances, when a particular paradigm faces a crisis, are scientists, unable to, are scientists able to develop major alternatives to the accepted theory. So Kuhn argued that there is actually a significant degree of dogmatism in science. And if this is right, then science often functions to suppress alternatives, which, of course, clearly supports Stanford's argument. Um, now, of course, there have been plenty of critics of Kuhn. You may, not, you may not accept his account, but there does seem to be something right about it. And if so, that perhaps explains why scientists have failed to develop alternative theories. Now, I mean, with, with, all, this, uh, with all this said, it's, I think it's kind of important to bear in mind exactly what Stanford is trying to establish in his argument. Um, Stanford thinks that we can infer from the history of science that we are probably failing to conceive of alternatives to currently accepted theories. I would suggest that the larger number of working scientists, the improvement in modern scientific methods, uh, and the fact that science over the last hundred years or so has been largely stable, I think that all of this blocks the induction from the failures of the past. Uh, the Kuhnian argument is very interesting, but um, I'm not sure if this is really a way of defending the uh, unconceived alternatives argument, as it is just a completely separate argument. 
for the claim that, that we that there are unconceived alternatives. Um, ultimately, I think Stanford's induction fails for basically the same reasons as the original pessimistic induction. Uh, the history of science simply doesn't support it. But but the you know the the, the kind of Kuhnian argument may be uh, another way of, um, of arguing that there are unconceived alternatives. Perhaps. Okay. A final objection from uh, Moti Mizrahi is that Stanford's argument is self-undermining. Mizrahi points out that precisely the same kind of induction that Stanford makes for science can be made for philosophy. So the history of philosophy suggests that, in the past, our best philosophical positions have faced serious objections that philosophers have been unable to conceive of at the time. Indeed, philosophy probably exhibits even greater tendencies to change than science does. For example, during the first half of the 19th century, logical positivism was widely accepted and it was applied to all areas of philosophy. Philosophy of science, philosophy of mind, meta-ethics, epistemology, uh, logical positivism was a universal program. And when you read the major texts of logical positivism, you have the impression that its adherents felt as though philosophy had been on completely the wrong track for all of history before them. But now, finally, you know, finally we've got the right theory, we've got the right method. Um, you can just, you can see it in, in, in the titles of uh, things like uh, Hans Reichenbach's The Rise of Scientific Philosophy. Um, that there's a real sense that we've finally kind of made it to the right method. And yet, of course, we now think that positivism faces severe objections. Objections that pretty much refute the, in, the entire program. Um, you know, most famously, the objection is raised by Quine in his paper, Two Dogmas of Empiricism. Very few, if any, contemporary philosophers are logical positivists. And I mean, the, you know, that's just one example. I could sit here all day going through examples of philosophical theories that were accepted, but then later it turned out they faced serious objections um, and they, they lost support. So it looks like we can make the following argument. Um, uh, premise one, the historical record reveals that past philosophers typically failed to conceive of serious objections to their then defensible theories. So, by induction, probably present philosophers fail to conceive of serious objections to their now defensible theories, their currently defensible theories. So, we should not believe our present philosophical theories. This, of course, is essentially just Stanford's argument applied to the history of philosophy, and it has some troubling consequences for him. The history of philosophy should lead us to expect that there are unconceived, serious objections to Stanford's unconceived alternatives argument. We should therefore not accept the argument. Uh, so immediately, uh, it looks like Stanford's argument is undermined. And more generally, the history of philosophy should uh, lead us to expect that there are unconceived, serious objections to all forms of scientific anti-realism. So we should not be scientific anti-realists. Of course, we can also conclude that there are serious, unconceived objections to scientific realism, so we shouldn't be realists either. Uh, we should simply suspend judgment on the issue. Um, we should j just not accept any philosophical position at all. Um, I mean, now that seems to be uh, perhaps something of a, a problem for uh, for this for this kind of, of argument. Um, uh, right. Uh, well, that's all for today. Um, uh, in in the last few videos, I guess we've been examining some objections to realism. The next video, I want to turn to some more strategies for defending realism. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that's all for now. I think that. Um, yeah, I think this is an interesting argument from Kyle Stanford. Um, I'm not sure that it's really successful, but um, I hope you found that interesting. Goodbye.